Brain and pain. So lasting effects of concussions and MTBI. Uh, when specifically talking about myself and why I'm talking about this, um, I've got a handful of different certifications. One of them is I'm also an instructor in anatomy and physiology at Owens. But besides that, I also uh, have a couple of other things that are kind of, I would say, important. That's just me. So I'm a uh, board certified functional neurologist. Uh, chiropractic neurologist. Basically, I have like nearly a thousand hours in diagnosis and treatments of different neurological disorders. Um, there, it, part of that is going to be con training in concussion management and in rehabilitation of the vestibular system. I also have other kind of coursework that I've done in uh, childhood neurobehavioral disorders uh, like ADHD, autism, things along those lines, as well as electrodiagnosis. And also specifically concerning concussion, I also have a certification as a certified chiropractic sports physician. Uh, basically, what these kind of things relate to is that it makes it so that I am one of the few chiropractors in the state of Ohio who is authorized to return youth to play after a concussion. So there's less than 40 chiropractors in Ohio that can do it. And there's somewhere around, I think there's like 6,000 of us or something like that in, in Ohio. So it's something that not very many uh, chiropractors have that ability to do it. Um, but I am one of the few that can. So uh, this is uh, another thing which is kind of which is kind of nice. Um, I've kind of blocked out some of the names here and a little bit of the faces, but this was a article that was done on uh, a patient of mine and myself uh, several years ago in the Mommy Mirror um, after a little boy basically got uh, injured. Uh, he basically was playing baseball and got hit in the head by a ball that was being thrown uh, in from the outfield uh, during a practice. And he was having post-concussion issues for more than a year. He actually got cleared to play uh, baseball uh, several weeks later. And then he also got cleared to play football later on. And it was affecting his schoolwork. His grades were going down. He had multiple different issues. And we helped all of that, um, helped him recover and do much better with all of that. So anyway, that was a little bit about me. So let's start talking a little bit more specifically about concussion. So concussion in and of itself, again, there's around uh, almost 2 million people a year are going to sustain a traumatic brain injury in the U.S. each year. And again, there's a significant percentage of those, like we'll say like uh, maybe a third, maybe a little bit around there, um, of those end up being children. So 475,000 children end up getting uh, concussion or traumatic brain injuries in a year. Again, obviously there's a range of that. Some of them are going to be very, very severe. Other ones are going to be a little bit less, but again, it's still a whole lot of concussions. Um, there's 3 million people who live with lifelong disabilities as a result of a traumatic brain injury. So it is very, very common for people to have issues. Again, 500 or 50,000 people dying per year due to uh, traumatic brain injuries, and again, uh, around 275,000 end up being hospitalized. And again, of those 1.7 million people that get a TBI, uh, around 1.3 end up going into the emergency room in order to get treated. The thing is, is that there's not a lot that can be done when someone does have a concussion. Um, there's not any medications that a person can be given. Uh, in order to stop the symptoms other than maybe controlling pain a little bit. So there's not a lot that can be done. It, that's not to say that somebody shouldn't go to the emergency room just in case, because part of the issue with some of these ends up being is that people can have brain bleeds and other kinds of things that end up being obviously uh, life-threatening and can be problematic and all that. So again, it's not to say that somebody shouldn't be going to the emergency room. It's just that there's not a lot that can actually be done when they when they go. So um, again, it's about a third of all injury related deaths are related to TBI. Um, around 75% uh, of TBIs are concussions or other forms of mild traumatic brain injuries. So again, you end up having, you know, much more serious injuries in about like 25% of them. But again, 
the general cost of TBI ends up being $76, or $76 billion per year. And again, that's if you measure the medical costs and indirect costs, such as a person not being able to go to work and the, the money that's lost by the company. So when you talk about concussions, where do people get concussions? And concussions are typically caused by a handful of things. Falls, car crashes ends up being a huge area where people end up getting issues with it. And most of the time people don't realize what's going on with it. Again, there's workplace accidents. So again, 35% ends up being falls. And again, that can be a slip and a fall and you know hitting your head on the ground. Um, car crashes end up being a significant amount. And then worse workplace accidents again, another significant percentage. And then th there's also like other places too. So you can get assaulted and stuff like that. And that's obviously um, issues that are there. But again, there's multiple different causes of TBIs. I mean, most people don't really, when it comes down to it, most people don't usually think about the idea of having that fall, right? Or I'm sorry, they, people don't usually think about the idea of the car crash. People will get into a car accident, and when they get the car accident, your brain can bounce around in the back of your head a little bit. And when that happens, uh, again, you end up getting a concussion, and you end up having issues related to that. You know, the other thing, and one of the other issues that, that's associated with it ends up being sports. And again, most people know about the um, you know the issues with football and other kinds of stuff, but there's um, a whole lot of different sports that have um, high rates when it comes down to injuries. Again, football ends up being one of the highest, but you end up having a very high percentage um, or a high number of, uh, and again, these are talking about kids, usually because again, adults aren't playing nearly as many sports. But when you talk about the different uh, sports, again, girl soccer ends up being number two. And people wouldn't think that girl soccer would end up being horrible, but again, the heading the ball and other kinds of stuff ends up having an impact on the players. Again, boy soccer ends up being up there. Girls basketball ends up being up there as well. And sometimes people wonder why you would end up having an issue with girls basketball being above wrestling. Because again, wrestling is literally a contact sport where they're grabbing a hold of each other and possibly slamming them to the ground and other kinds of stuff like that. But the general idea is, is that, and this is just one of those things, is that in, in general between uh, a, uh, one of the girls' sports and one of the boys' sports, um, you know, if you're talking about in high school and in like the lower levels, like, you know, little league type of things and stuff like that, if you're talking about those things, the girls have the tendency to get more, especially in high school, get more concussions in the same type of sport between like soccer, basketball because of the fact that there ends up having to be, the women end up having to have the tendency to have less muscle mass than guys do. So they can end up getting hit in the body and end up suffering a concussion. Um, again, everybody can get that, but that's one of the reasons why that kind of stuff happens. But it's something to just kind of point out because again, um, people think about concussions and you know, football has been the big thing that's been in the news. But again, it's not just an issue when it comes to football. Now, when it comes down to it, there's multiple different symptoms that a person can end up having that is associated with concussions. Obviously, headaches is one of the major issues, but again, you can end up having issues with dizziness and vertigo. Uh, tinnitus, which is gonna be that ringing in the ears. Um, there's hearing loss, blurred vision, um, issues with sensitivity to noise and light. So again, phonophobia would be the issues with having um, sensitivity to noise and photophobia is the issue with light, irritability, anxiety, depression, personality changes, um, again, fatigue, decreased libido, problems with appetite, you know, issues with uh, nausea and vomiting, again, that can be associated with the vertigo as well. And then other issues like cognitive impairment, problems with memory, problems with concentration and attention. Uh, slowing of the reaction times, and then slowing of the information processing speed. So these are all different things that are associated with, and again, this is stuff that can happen with an injury um, when it comes to sports, but it can also be something that happens with an injury with, that's associated with a, uh, a car accident or a workplace accident as well. So those are things that are obviously things to look out for. 
So uh, this ends up becoming an issue in, in some cases in car accidents. So people will be in a car accident and then they get overwhelmed with the fact that they've maybe never been in a car accident before and they get stressed because of the fact that their car is damaged and they don't know how they're going to be able to get to work and they have all kinds of other things that they need to figure out. And at the same time as all of that, they end up having a concussion at the same time and maybe they don't make the right decisions uh, when it comes to what they should do from a uh, financial standpoint. Maybe they sign away their rights when they shouldn't or other kinds of stuff like that. So there's multiple different issues when it comes down to it and people don't realize that concussion ends up being a major part of um, you know, car accidents. Again, not everybody gets a car accident and you don't have to actually hit your head on anything in the car in order to get that concussion. So, but let's take a look a little bit about what happens with, with a concussion in general. So in general, the idea is that there are what they call coup and counter coup injuries. The idea is, is that there's damage that can happen, obviously, from the impact, right? So when you're talking about something that if this is like a wall or something and somebody slammed their head up against it for whatever reason, you would obviously get the impact of the brain hitting the bone on the inside of the skull. And where that ends up getting the, the bone actually ends up hit, there ends up being bruising, there could be damage there as well. But the other thing that can happen is, is that the damage can be at the site of the impact, but it can also be directly opposite of that impact. So if it's there and you end up having the injury here, sometimes you'll get the brain basically slamming into the front and then you end up having the bounce back where you'll end up getting the brain coming back and hitting in the other direction. The other thing that can happen is that you can get neuronal shearing. And what that means is, is that, you know, in the brain, we have neurons, which are one of the, the main structures that are, that's there, the one that actually communicates information, and they talk back and forth to each other and stuff like that. And these neurons have these axons that will go from one place in the brain to connect. So you can have a, a, something from the frontal lobe getting a connection back here from the occipital lobe so that you can get vision and other kinds of stuff. But all of that can affect behavior and other kinds of things. So there's all kinds of different interconnections that happen in the brain in, within the same lobe and even connections that would happen on one lobe connecting to the other side. So there's a bunch of different stuff that happens. If you end up getting an injury, sometimes you can end up getting a breaking of some of those connections, which can be part of the, the problem that a person can get with a concussion. Um, there's other things that happen, not just with the coup and counter coup, but you can also, uh, it, it may be a little bit more likely if a person has torsional forces that are associated with it. So what that means is that if there was rotation that's associated with that. So like the example to be used in that would be uh, maybe in like boxing or in MMA. Um, it, it's one thing to be struck with something that's coming straight at you, but there's a difference when someone gets hit with something coming from the side. So in boxing or MMA, that would be a hook versus like a straight or a cross or a jab or something like that. And basically the idea is, is that the torsional forces end up doing more damage in a lot of cases. And where this can end up being an issue is, is that for an example, like in a car accident, if a person has their head turned to the side, so if they get struck from the back, you know, and they end up having like a whiplash type of an injury, there's a difference between whether or not the person has their head looking straight ahead, or if you have your head turned to the side and you're speaking to your passenger, or if you have your head and your chin looking up at the mirror and you're looking and seeing what's happening behind you. So you hear the squealing or whatever, and then you turn and you brace and all that, you can end up getting the torsional forces. And basically what happens with that is, is that with the torsional forces, the forces end up being kind of concentrated where there's more movement that happens out here in the periphery, but the forces, the actual like damaging forces happen more in the middle part of the brain. So those are going to be more of those central type of structures. So in through here, you're going to be talking about the brain stem, again, the thalamus, which is going to be in this general area here, the basal ganglia, which is also going to be central here, and then the cerebellum in the backside. So 
These are going to be things that can be hard to identify, they can be hard to treat, and these are going to be some of the things that can lead to ongoing symptoms of concussion. So again, there's multiple different uh, issues with that. Again, people can end up having problems with controlling blood pressure and their heart rates and other kinds of like fight or flight issues that are related from brainstem damage. Um, people can end up having, you know, a lot of times there ends up being issues when it comes to balance and vertigo and other kinds of things uh, that's associated with the cerebellum. So multiple different things can be associated with it. Now, after a person gets a concussion, you end up having some inflammatory kind of things that can happen. So immediately after a concussion, there's damage. So the person is gonna have a little bit of an increased demand for oxygen and glucose as they're trying to go through repairs. You can also have uh, immune reactions that can happen and autoimmunity sometimes can result. The, the other thing that ends up being an issue is that there ends up being issues with after a concussion, you actually open up the blood brain barrier. And there's research that shows that once somebody has had damage to the brain, that blood brain barrier is not as sealed up as what it should be so that things can sometimes get in. And that can be where the issues with like the autoimmunity and the immune reactions happen. And the thing that ends up being even crazier than that is that there's also research that shows that the gut lining itself, you're supposed to have a, uh, a barrier in the gut in order to stop um, microbes and food particles and other kinds of stuff um, from the inside part of the gut to cross over and get into the blood. But that lining can become more, it can become damaged and you can end up getting something that's called leaky gut or you can have things come across which can also relate to other issues with uh, immune reactions and autoimmunity and other things as well. So those are just like the, the chemical kind of things that can happen after damage. And basically when it comes down to it, there's, a, there's you know, that, that's just what happens with a concussion, but there's certain ways that you can actually identify concussion. And some of this is gonna be more specific to maybe what would happen in like a sports environment, but all of these things, can have a all, all of these things can end up being interrelated with uh, a person going through their day-to-day -day life so for example there's grading scales that you can get so there's issues with memory loss that people can have or loss of consciousness so you, it, you can grade and see how awake that somebody is afterwards did they lose consciousness did they not lose consciousness did the person have issues with memory loss um and where you know where they have a inability to uh, remember things or lay down new memories afterwards, or they have a, a harder time laying down new memories. Again, this is not just necessarily just an inability, but you could end up having a harder time or it's more of a struggle. Um, the, and basically there, there's ways to grade all of this stuff. One of the things that can be done is something called neuropsych testing. So you can go to a neuropsychologist and you can end up getting a battery of exams that are done that are gonna be able to go through and assess cognitive and emotional symptoms. Um, this is something the neuropsych testing ends up getting used a lot of times in dementia issues as well because this, it can be something that can really get down and grade and figure out where the the dementia, uh, what's actually what type of dementia it is, um, depending on the, the stage that the person ends up getting that addressed. Now, the, the thing is, is that all of these things, again, are issues that end up being on the symptom list. Again, there's cognitive impairment that somebody can have. There's emotional impairment that a person can have. There's obviously the issue with the loss of consciousness is one thing, but again, issues with memory loss. All of those are things that happen along with the symptom list. And again, those are some ways that you can help to identify it. But again, if you don't have the pre-testing that happens beforehand, then it's kind of hard to know what kind of functionality has been lost. So there's certain types of tests, and I know that there are some that are done around here, like I believe that uh, Southview has their, uh, their players, at least in football, go through and do something called impact testing, which can be a good thing because that can give you an idea of how well that a player is doing before the football season starts. And then 
during the football season, or let, let's say that there ends up being an issue where there's a possible concussion, if you have them retake that impact testing and they, if they score worse by whatever specific percentage that they have, then you can know that there has probably been some type of, some type of functionality that's been lost during the season. So that's something that can be helpful. But again, if you don't have that pre-testing, then it's hard to know what kind of issues that a person has actually lost. So uh, issues that are associated with concussion, again, they're related to that, the, the functional losses that are related to the concussion, and those are where the symptoms come from. So again, you should try to uh, identify concussion and you should assess those functional losses. And one of the best ways that you can actually do that is looking at the eyes. So the eyes can actually be a good window, you know, they say that they're a window into the soul, but they're also a good window in the brain to see how well that the brain is actually doing when it comes to uh, the, the actual issues associated with concussion. So um, when it comes to functional neurology, this is one of those kind of things that ends up being, uh, you know, concussion ends up being directly in our wheelhouse. Because again, there's not a lot of other things that you can do. You can't really do imaging at this point to see whether or not a person has concussion. So you can't give the person an MRI and say, yes, you have a concussion or you don't. Um, there is not, uh, there's not medication is not something that you can just do and say, Hey, I'm going to give you this and this is going to make your vertigo get better. Again, some, there might be some things when it comes to like headaches and stuff like that. And somebody might be able to, to get some kind of anti-nausea medication, but there's not really going to be anything that's going to be able to stop some of those issues, um, when it comes to the traditional medical kind of a model. But when it comes to functional neurology, the, these are the general steps that we go through. You have to identify the different uh, functions that are there and you have to measure the functions. You have to identify any deficits that a person may have. You have to know the different functional relationships between the different neurological systems. So how does the brain and the frontal lobe relate to the cerebellum? And then you have to go through and use therapeutic strategies in order to target and restore normal function. Again, the idea is, is that you're trying to use exercises in order to actually restore function by just, just like you would from the standpoint of doing rehab on uh, a, an arm muscle um, in order to restore strength uh, if a person ends up having shoulder surgery or something like that. Again, there's multiple different things that are associated with it. One of the things um, associated with it is eye movements, and this is something that we had talked about before. So there is uh, observation of eye movements, and in some cases, some places actually have video recording that you can do. Um, there's reflexive movements that can happen, and then there's vestibular reflexes that are part of those reflexive movements. And then you also have voluntary movements. So basically, there's one of the things that we have here in our office is the ability to track the eyes. And basically with this device, and I'll show you a different picture here in a second, what you can do is you can actually take this and you can cover up the person so that they can't see anything, and you can move their head around and see exactly how they, uh, their eyes react to them being moved around or them doing different things, see if there ends up being issues with the, the pupils and the opening that's associated with that. So there's multiple different things. You know, can they hold their eyes still? when they're covered or when they're not covered? Can they actually smoothly track an object? Is there jumping of the eyes called saccades? Is there uh, a, an issue when it comes to, uh, again, virtual reality would be another thing that you, you could actually do, which uh, can kind of mess with people in some cases. But again, the jumping, the smooth track, the smooth tracking are all issues that are associated with that. So one example, again, this is a, a picture of somebody that can have their head moved around again while you're assessing for different types of function of the eyes again if you know the general idea is is that if a person is looking straight ahead their eyes should be able to stay in that same position even if you move the head left and right their their eyes should be able to look straight in whatever position that you're holding them in so in this case you're going to end up having these videos or these cords that are going to come back and it allows you to actually record in something like this what's going on. So this would be the same kind of uh, person with the real eyes with the cameras that are here. And again, you can see her eyes 
in the background, even though it's in the dark because they're infrared cameras. Same thing over and through here. You can actually see the person, you know, again, nobody's actually hooked up to these eyes, but you can see the eyes that are there and you can have the person do things and see how the eyes move. Again, when someone's following something in one direction, your eyes should be able to smoothly move from side to side. What there shouldn't be is there shouldn't be following and then jump and then follow and jump. It should be like a constant continuous movement as opposed to something that's like that, right? So there's multiple different issues that, that are there. So part of all this is knowing you know, what's going on with the vestibular system. So the vestibular system is gonna be the feeling that we have uh, or the, the feeling that we have of movement inside of the brain. Right. So when you feel you yourself moving, you feel yourself accelerating. If you, you know, not if you were driving, but if you were in a car and you, you had your eyes closed and you could feel like the acceleration of your body moving forward, or you slowing down or going in reverse or turning left or right. Or if you're in a elevator and the feeling that you get of accelerating upwards or accelerating downwards or the deceleration when you start to slow down at the end. All of those end up being things that are associated with movement. But the thing about it is, is that that vestibular system is also wired into our eyes. Our eyes have the ability to reflexively move based on how we are moving. So the idea is, is that again, if you're sitting there and you're looking at the screen, if you look in the center here, let's say that you're gonna look at the center right there at that red dot. If you look at that red dot and you turn your head to the left just a little bit, right? Let's say like 30 degrees to the left, and then you come back to the center, you should be able to control that movement and keep your eyes on that dot the entire time. As you continue to, to move, if you were to move to the right or to the left, you should be able to keep your eyes on that dot the entire time, right? It doesn't matter how fast that you move your head, you should be able to keep them on there. So if you move this slowly to the left, or if you moved it from the center and went quickly to the right, you should be able to keep your eyes on that dot because of the fact that our eyes are wired into our inner ear, okay? So we end up having this control the reflexes in the eyes. The same kind of thing happens where the vestibular system will help to control the reflexes in the body. So if you feel yourself falling towards one side, the body will contract and then it'll make pull you so that you end up being more upright. So you're going to be less likely to fall over. That's going to be part of what we're using with balance on a daily basis. So the eyes is going to have something to do with it. The movements then of the body is going to be part of it. And again, when it comes down to it, that vestibular system, when it gets damaged, you can end up having an issue where the body can end up having a bad function of the vestibular system, which means that you can perceive that you're having too much movement, that you're having too little movement, or you're even moving in the wrong direction. So there's all kinds of different things that can have an effect on that. And the idea is, is that you end up having an impact in your brain uh, based off of this, and you also have an impact of your eyes. So a, a good example of this is I, I was having a conversation with a patient about this just today. And so the idea is, is that you're supposed to have everything matching. You know, when people sometimes wonder why I named it Harmony Chiropractic, I named it Harmony from the standpoint of you need to have balance between the muscles in the body, but you also have to have balance between the different areas of the brain. So what I mean by that is, is that if you can imagine somebody who ends up getting motion sickness, people that end up getting motion sickness have a, a hard time with the actual movement of their body compared with what they actually see. So for example, somebody who's motion sick, where does that person have to be in the car? Ideally, the person who's motion sick wants to be driving the car. That's what they wanna do because they know what movement they're gonna do. They know how fast that they're gonna apply the brake. They know how fast that they're gonna hit the accelerator. So they end up having control, so it gives them less of an issue. So usually people that end up having uh, an issue when it comes to um, the, the, the problem with, the, um, with, with getting motion sick, they want to drive. But if they can't drive, where do they wanna be in the car? Do they wanna be in the back, in the middle? No, everybody that ends up having an issue with um, 
with, with the uh, with a movement disorder or with ha having an issue with motion sickness wants to be in the passenger seat up front because that's going to be the next thing. It's also uh, the same kind of thing that somebody ends up getting seasick. When it comes to somebody getting seasick, sometimes people make the mistake of going down below deck because they don't want to be sick in front of other people. And that's understandable, but the problem is, is that when you're down and below deck, you can't see the horizon and you can't see like land or the horizon or whatever is actually out there. So you don't have a frame of reference of what is standing still because the person's ears are not matching what their eyes are seeing. So if you're in the back of the car, right, you can't see the traffic that's in front of you. So you don't know why the person is accelerating or not. And you can just see the inside of the car, maybe like if you're on the left side and in the back, you can only see the right side of the car isn't moving at all, but you're seeing some movement out of the left. And it ends up kind of throwing off your, the, you know, your picture, your, in, your inner picture of what's actually going on in the world. So there's multiple issues when it comes to that. And again, if your brain is telling you that you end up having that, you know, the, the, the amount of movement that, that you perceive should be the exact amount of movement that was there. But if you end up being too sensitive and you perceive too much movement, then it can throw you off. If you don't perceive enough movement, that can throw you off. And again, sometimes people can end up perceiving the wrong direction of movement or feeling like they're moving when they're not actually moving. Um, some people have had the experience of after maybe um, having a few too many drinks of alcohol of laying down and feeling that the room is spinning. Um, there ends up, you know, there, there's different kind of things that end up being associated with that. But again, it's having a perception of movement when there isn't actually movement. So the idea is, is that, you know, there's other kinds of things about this vestibular function that you can use to assess it. So eye movement ends up being one of them, but you can use eye movement for one thing, you can use a person's gait, so you can do an analysis of somebody walking down the hallway. You can do it maybe with their eyes or closed, or you can try to distract them a little bit and see if it changes their gait. Checking the person's balance, so having the person stand with their feet together and seeing whether or not they have any uh, problems with balance, or closing their eyes and seeing if they have problems with balance. Another one ends up being limits of stability, which, which what that means is, is that if you were to stand up, and don't hurt yourself doing this, but if you were to stand up with your eyes open, how far forward could you lean before you started to fall over, right? Or if you started to lean yourself to the right as far as you could, what is the limit of stability that you have? So how much can you shift your body weight to the right before you lose your balance? Everybody's going to have a certain limit, but you should have a certain amount, and there's like there are numbers out there that are available based on your age on how far you should be able to move. Um, reactions to perturbation. What that means is, is that if you're standing there and you get a little bit of a, of a shove, right? If somebody pushes you just a little bit, does that make you go flying and make you fall over? Or can you adjust to that motion and uh, make sure that you maintain your balance. Another thing is computerized posturography. So that's something that I can do, and there'll, there'll be some graphs that I can show you here in a little bit, which is something where you basically have a person stand on something and see how much actual sway that their body has. Everybody has a little bit of sway when they go to stand. Um, with your eyes open, you had a, a little bit less sway with your eyes open. You have a little bit more movement when your eyes are closed. And then if you were to stand on something soft, you're going to have a little bit more movement because when it comes to balance, balance ends up having three different factors that are going to be associated with it. One thing is, is that you're going to use your vision in order to maintain your balance. The other thing is going to be joint position. So the information coming up from your ankle is also going to let you know about how your balance is doing. And then the last part is going to be vestibular and that's going to be the inner ear. So if you were to stand on this, this ends up being this foam cushion that's here that kind of messes with your joint position sense. So if you're just testing that vestibular input and the vision input, there you go. Well, what happens when you stand on this, but then you end up closing your eyes? How good is your balance going to be? So you can actually see in something that's along these lines. So this is an example of a uh, computerized posturography thing that, um, that uh, I can have printed out here in my office. So if you look at this, 
This would be somebody that's standing here with their eyes open, that's standing on a firm platform. And you can see that there's gonna be movement that's gonna happen, but it's not all that much movement. You look over here and the person is gonna have their eyes closed and they're standing on a firm platform. So this is gonna be like basically standing on solid ground. Notice that there's a lot more movement. If you look at this one, this is gonna be where you're gonna have a little bit more movement, but you're on a soft platform. So you end up taking away some of that joint position sense. And then you take this one, where again, this is a whole lot of movement in comparison. But again, even though this one ends up having a lot more movement than this, there's grading based on a person's age and, uh, and, and basically on their age to determine on how well things end up being. So you can see that everything here is graded at very good. And for some of these, you end up getting the falls risk that are associated with certain things. But again, this one also gives you your balance age, right? So again, it's better to be younger when it comes to this balance age here. So it gives you an idea of, of what you have. So this one has the balance of like a 20 year old or a 15 year old, right? And again, all of these end up being very good. This gives you an idea of what it's like for things to be poor. Again, this is with the eyes open on a, on a firm surface. There's a whole lot of movement. This is really, really poor when it comes down to it. So again, this would be the balance age of 100 years old, right? Which is not good. But that's, again, a 95% fall risk. That is not good at all. This one is when it's on a firm platform and the eyes are closed. So again, notice that there's a difference. A lot of times people will end up having issues when it comes down to it. So for example, like someone might get to the point where when they're going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, they have to turn the light on because they have to know where they're going and they can't walk around in a dark room or they get to the point where they have to put their hand on the wall and trace the wall as they're walking to make sure that they actually keep their balance. So these are things that people will do to compensate. So you can see that there's all these different things are very poor and people have different issues. But again, you can see the comparison between these two people. Again, they're different people. So people have different issues, but again, you can see that this is more normal where something should be. And when you have way more movement, this is just one thing that's there. The thing that can be great though, is that you can actually go through and you can take this. And the thing that's pretty cool is that this is actually the same person. So when you have this person again in June of 2018 versus in August of 2019, again, they're not being tested continually or they're not getting treated continually for that long. It doesn't take that long for somebody to get better. But you can see that somebody later on, their balance is gonna improve over time when they end up having um, uh, treatment. So again, that's gonna be a, a definitely an issue that people can use to recover. So the issues about uh, treating concussions is that all head injuries end up being unique. There's not like a specific kind of like, uh, protocol that you can use on every single person. Again, there's different forces that are associated with the person getting injured in the first place. Again, the person might have had a different reaction. There's a different status that's there before the injury. Again, there is going to be a difference between somebody and what it is that they're doing. If somebody ends up having fibromyalgia, they're probably going to have a harder time recovering after getting a concussion than somebody who was active and uh, constantly going to their, uh, you know, if they're constantly going and doing CrossFit or going to something like Renegade Fitness or something along those lines, or if they're constantly working out or if they have a kickboxing class or something like that. They're, again, if a person ends up being really fit beforehand, they're gonna end up having some padding, you could say, as to what type of damage that they can take before they end up having issues. Again, and everybody is gonna have a different ability to recover. Some people are gonna recover faster than others just in general. Again, when it comes down to it, because all of those head injuries are unique, is that the individual treatments need to be unique as well. People are gonna have different functional losses. There's gonna be different symptoms. Again, headache ends up being really common. Problems with light and sound end up being really common, but you know, the person might have vertigo, they might not. They might have uh, tinnitus, they might not. Again, there's different mechanisms that are gonna be involved. 
but there are some general things that you can look at in order to help a person to, to figure things out. So when it comes down to treating concussion, again, resting, again, up to two weeks and not doing a whole lot can be something that can be very advantageous. Again, and this ends up being one of the places where people end up having issues because especially if a person ends up being like a really like a type A type of a personality where they really want to always like push things and try to, you know, they can't rest and they've got to do, that ends up being somebody that end up, might end up being more likely to end up getting a lasting kind of an issue with a concussion. And the people that can't back off or that don't have the ability to take it easy. Again, if they're always go, 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 and they get hurt and they don't give themselves the chance to rest, then the likelihood of somebody getting a long lasting effect from a concussion ends up going way, way, way up. So there ends up being issues when it comes down to those different things. So um, when it comes to vestibular therapy, again, if a person has issues with balance, if they have issues with eye movement, if they end up having problems with the, the way that their body is integrating the sensory system with the motor system, there can be cognitive problems. Again, sometimes people are definitely going to need to talk to a psychologist that's associated with these things based on what's going on. Sometimes there can be other things that they can do in order to work on like memory and other kinds of stuff like that. Um, when it comes to specific sports, there can be activities with sports that can be specific that you can use. You can also use drills. And then there's also the, the question on return to play. We'll talk about that a little bit more towards the end. But again, the, the basis for recommending those physical and cognitive rest, it may be beneficial, but there's not loads and loads of evidence that complete rest is going to help to achieve the objective. The idea is that you need to, you know, not bite off more than you can chew, right? A person doesn't need to be necessarily like holed up in a room staring at the wall and doing absolutely nothing. But if the person is watching TV or a movie and it's making their symptoms come on, then that's problematic. So again, it's not going to be a good thing for somebody to get a concussion and to go out and do like a 12 mile run the next day, right? Or to do some kind of like crazy, like um, hit training type of a thing where they're doing like, you know, kettlebell swings and going on a mile run and coming back and doing pull-ups and all kinds of other stuff. So you need to make sure that you are resting and resting enough for what you need. Um, and unfortunately things got messed up on this one. But again, these are some of the ways that you're gonna exercise the brain. There's receptor-based applications that you can use. So you can use taste in order to go through rehab, smell, sight, again, touch and movement, hearing, vestibular information. Again, basically we end up having a whole bunch of different senses, right? So we have the, you know, the, the five senses that people talk about, we actually have more than that. But you can use those senses um, and you can use those different types of um, processes that our brain needs to use in order to help to exercise the brain. Because that's basically what you want to do. You want to exercise the brain, but you want to exercise it and you do it within the person's capabilities. So um, when it comes down to it, again, some examples, again, you know, hopscotch, you know, in some cases that's going to work for somebody that has a concussion, usually not right away working on balance, people that end up having, you know, doing yoga. Those are things that can, you know, just working on balance in and of itself and trying to stand on one leg is something that can be hugely beneficial for somebody. And obviously once this happens, and if a person can do that and exercise is not causing a problem, then maybe if they hopped from one place to another and they just hopped and tried to hold their balance without falling, and then eventually try to do like three or four hops, then it may, uh, eventually that, that might be a good thing for them, but it just depends on the person and the, and the situation. Uh, one thing that we use in our office is an app that's called Focus Builder. Uh, so we would basically get something set up for a person. So again, doing different types of pursuits with the eyes, saccades, moving, uh, I'm sorry, saccades, and then moving with those saccades and then pursuing and moving and going back and forth. Again, there's multiple different types of stimulation. Again, one example would be doing, you can get something where this is, can jump across the screen and based on what the person's issue is, 
again, it could be too advanced for a person, so it might not be what the person needs. And it depends on the individual. Some people are going to need to get uh, that customized type of work, and other people, um, you know, it, it it definitely depends on the person. So somebody might be able to do a therapy at a, a you know within a couple of days afterwards, and some people might need to wait. So. That's one thing. This could smoothly move across the screen and you can track it with your eyes. There can be different things that pop back and forth. You can use different fields like this where this would alternate between being blue and white and then it would flip where these blue would go over to white and everything would basically go back and forth. You can use this as a whole field stimulus or you can use this as a partial field stimulus based on what a person needs. Again, the issue when it comes down to returning to work or returning to play is that there ends up being issues with a person if they still have effects that are lingering from the first concussion. So for example, it is a poor idea for somebody that still has issues with headaches and balance problems and slow reaction time and they can't do math flashcards as fast as what they normally could. If they have the a problem thinking, it's not a good idea to have them go back into a football game because the likelihood is, is that they are going to get a, another concussion um, because they haven't fully healed. It's just easier to give them that, con that second concussion when they haven't fully healed. Again, um, the lasting symptoms that you can get from a concussion can often happen after having a second injury. So it might be that the person may have fully recovered from the like just having one concussion, but having one concussion followed by another one when the person hasn't fully healed might give the person the ability to have, you know, symptoms that last years, like years and years and years. And again, there's the assessment of non-cognitive vestibular function ends up being part of that. So how smoothly someone's eyes move can be a big part of how well or whether or not a person should return to play. And again, the pre and post testing ends up being one thing that ends up being a great determinant on whether or not a person um, should go back to play. And again, if a person ends up being an elite athlete, their reaction time is gonna be a lot better than your average type of person. But in, if that elite athlete is scoring 20% less than what they were doing before, then the person isn't recovered. Um, cognitive functions can be ineffective while the vestibular functions remain impaired. So again, it depends on the person and it depends on the issue. So when it comes to athletes and returning to play, this is the general idea. There, you know, this is going to be pretty much up to date. You know, again, depending on uh, this will be on YouTube eventually, and uh, when somebody's watching this later, it may have shifted since uh, when I've done this today. But this is the general idea on how to get somebody to return to school, and it's the same thing when it comes to return to school or return to work, basically, right? So daily activities at home that do not give the person symptoms, right? So just going through and sitting around shouldn't be giving the person symptoms. Reading texting, screen time, stuff like that. Again, you do just a little bit at a time and then you build up. You don't just let the kid watch six hours of TV straight or binge watch on Netflix, you know, all day long because they would just be, you know, they might be bored, but if they're watching the screen and they're paying attention to what's going on, that could end up being problematic. So you start with five minutes. Okay, you did five minutes and that didn't cause any problems, awesome. Okay, we're going to give you a break for, you know, let's say 10 minutes, right? And then you can watch another five minutes worth of stuff like YouTube videos or something like that for a little bit, right? And if those kind of things aren't having problems, then you can gradually build up. You can increase the amount of time that the person has that they're watching, and then you can decrease the amount of rest and you would build up that. And again, eventually they get back to being able to do the typical activities that they can do during the day. Then you start having the person go back to activities that you would do during school or maybe even activities that you would do at home. So whether or not the person could like, you know, for some people, they might be able to remotely log in and do some work at home. That could be a possibility, but you wouldn't necessarily want to go back full time. Same kind of thing with school. You want to be able to make sure that the person can actually do a little bit of homework. It's not good to have a person that just got injured 
have them start doing homework, you know, the next day or making sure that they, you know, are, are taking care of things when the person isn't fully back to, um, back to where they should be. And again, once they can do the cognitive work, then you can return to school part-time and see how they do. They might need to have partial days of school. They might need to have rests where they go to the school nurse. And again, this is obviously, it depends on if a person is, you know, at work, how flexible that your work would be with this, but it's the same kind of stuff. So you increase the academic activities and then eventually you would go and return to school full time. Same kind of thing was going to happen. Again, you gradually progress and you get the full activities until you can go for a full day. And again, catch up on missed work and do the things that you need to do. The other thing that's going to be associated with this is a person returning to sport. So these are two different things that are going to be associated with a person doing things. And again, you want to do these things in the right way. Symptom limited activity. You want to be going through these daily activity things in the same general kind of way because a person should be going back to sport if homework is causing them a problem, right? They need to be able to, you know, for a kid that's playing, uh, you know, football or basketball or soccer or whatever, if they get a concussion, you don't want their math homework to cause, you know, issues of nausea and other kinds of stuff, but then still let the kid go and run around and, and do other issues. So you need to make sure that they can get back into the school and work activities. Then can they actually like do light aerobic exercise, something that's going to increase their heart rate a little bit, something that can add a little bit more movement, then doing more specific uh, exercises for a sport. So doing running and skating drills, not having any impact on the head, doing more specific type of movements with sport. Uh, Non-contact training drills, so moving a little bit harder, getting into passing in soccer or basketball. Again, doing some weightlifting. And again, as long as it's not increasing the person's symptoms, you can have this happen over just like the period of a course of days. So these stages might take a full day to get through, but after a week, you should be able to get back to normal gameplay if the person has gotten a concussion. And again, it's important to go through these steps in order to make sure that a person isn't getting things that last. Because this, is, this next one is kind of a scary type of, um, type of graphic. This is a graphic that shows uh, post-concussion symptom issues that you have in patients and the persistence in certain patients that are gonna relax that are gonna happen after a mild head injury. And again, there's variation with what you're actually gonna call a mild head injury. But again, the vast majority, again, you're talking in one study it was 71% and another study was 36, claimed that headache was gonna be a symptom in a week. 90% had headaches after a month, right? Dizziness in 53% at the beginning, right? Memory problems in almost 20% of them after a month right? Irritability issues with people in post-concussion syndrome. So again, these are people that didn't heal right, right? But this is the kind of persistence that people can have. Irritability. Obviously, if you're going to have issues with headache and dizziness and memory problems, there's going to be some irritability going on with that as well. But again, if you look all the way out here, people that have issues, again, there's issues that people can have four years later, where 25% of people will end up having headaches almost 20% have dizziness and almost 20% end up having memory problems. So multiple different issues that can happen over multiple different years. So it's just one of those kind of things where of, of all of this, you know, it is important to make sure that you are preventing head injuries, making sure that you're wearing the protective gear, making sure that you're not doing, um, you know, the, in, in sports that you're not hitting with the head or hitting with the helmet and that kind of stuff. If a school offers pre-screening, then definitely go and get that pre-screening just to make sure that you know where you're at. And again, the issue is, is that there's neuropsych testing and like things like that impact test that I was talking about. They don't cover all of the problems associated with concussion because those neuropsych tests don't deal with uh, vestibular screening. They don't deal with other issues with concussion. Again, all concussions end up being unique. Um, it is something that because all concussions are unique, the treatment should be unique. So, and you should go to somebody who knows what they're doing. So if you know anybody that has issues re related to concussion, if you have it yourself, if you have a friend or a family member or anything that has issues with concussion, uh, obviously I would invite you to 
go ahead and have them contact me or uh, get a hold of us so you guys can get scheduled so that we can um, try to assess them and try to get them feeling better. Um, I appreciate you attending. Um, appreciate your attention uh, that's associated with all of this. Um, obviously, if you had any questions, we could take a look at that. Um, I'm not sure if anybody does or not. If you have any questions, uh, that's great. If not, go ahead and uh, if this is in the YouTube video later on, go ahead and leave questions below. And then obviously, I'd appreciate you subscribing and checking out some of my other videos. Uh, thank you very much, and I will talk to you later. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.